Good morning. Good job, Grant. Um, it was kind of funny. I got to move this out a little bit. It has my teleprompter on it, so you guys can try to stay on track. So, um, Grant's mom was so worried that Grant was going to go rogue and stand up here, tell jokes, and destroy the announcement thing, but he did a great job. Uh, he even... He even outdressed us all. I was like, awesome. So today is Youth Sunday. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Tom Almost. I am the interim director of student ministries. So it's like, um, kind of like sort of the guy, but not. Anyways, we'll get to that. I'll explain that a little bit more, um, what that means and What's my future? Maybe. Uh, who knows after today? But as Kevin came up, he, he, he recognized the youth leaders. And instead of just standing up, can you raise your hand again? The youth, adult youth leaders. Can you raise your hand? There's a few there. There's some in the back there over here. I also want to recognize my wife because she's like the ultimate youth leaders. She looks after me. But I also want to recognize the past youth leaders. If you've ever been a youth leader, raise your hand. So there's a, there's a bunch over here, past youth leaders. I, I really, really do thank you guys because you make my job so much easier um, when we have quality youth leaders. And we also have quality students. If you're a student, raise your hand. All right, okay, there's a bunch of students, some that have been working, yes. But also, if you are a past student, say you once were a student, <laughs> raise your hand, yeah. And, and the future students, there's a couple of them over here, future students. So you see that youth ministry is really connected. It's all a part of the church. You know, we are an important ministry just like a lot of the other ministries, the women's ministry, the men's ministry, children's ministry. It, it, it's all a part of the church and it's important. And so I really thank all of you guys, the students, the future students, I look forward to seeing you guys. Um, the present students, you guys amaze me uh, up here singing. We got guys over in the little tech booth back there. They're, they're flipping slides for you. We got announcement guy over, well, he left, but he was over there. Um, and I love you guys. I love you all. You guys amaze me. And uh, we're going to go on with the sermon. But I want to open up in a short prayer because I need it. <laughs> I'm not used to talking to adults. I'm used to talking to kids. So if I'm a little sketchy, a little... You know, give me some grace, because <laughs> I'll take it. So let's pray, and we'll get started. Father in heaven, thank you for our time. Thank you for Youth Sunday, where the youth get to be a little bit more involved, up front, hanging out with us, uh, leading us in worship, working on the technical side, um, and greeting and ushering, all the things that they've been doing. Thank you, God, so much for their willingness to serve. Um, I pray that you would be honored by the message, and I pray that in Jesus' name. So, now I got to work two slides. All right, so the title of my sermon or message is kind of odd. It's called uh, The Sermon That Will Never Be Preached, The Sermon That No One Will Hear, and it sounds weird. It sounds maybe apocalyptic or something. What happened? Am I preaching to nobody because I got left behind? I, nothing like that. It's, this sermon has its genesis about a year and a half ago. Um, when I was in a period of my time, what I would call it out of season. You know, we had Jared Carline, he had just taken over the youth program, and I had stepped back a little bit, and I'm trying to figure out where I fit in, and I'm thinking, I'm out of season. And I was sitting over there, oops, I was sitting <laughs> over there, there you go, I got to keep track of my buttons. I was sitting over there, 
and uh, that's the bald guy with the mustache and the blue shirt, blue shirt. And Kevin was preaching, and he said something that kind of struck a chord in my brain. Sometimes that happens. And I started to swirl. He was talking about how he developed or was writing a sermon. And I was like, what, what goes into writing a sermon? And, I, and my brain is just going crazy. If you guys know me, you know that's kind of how it works. It just, and it starts to swirl. And I'm sure the people that were sitting behind me saw smoke coming out of my ears. And I was like, man, I wish Kevin would continue on in that thought that he had thrown out there about sermons, writing, and developing. How do you do that? And who does that? Remember, I'm in this out-of-season time, and I'm trying to figure out what am I supposed to be doing? Well, you know, and I was like, come on, Kevin, help me out. And Kevin went on with his sermon. It went another way. I was like, dang. Well, I'm thinking to myself, self, <laughs> Why don't I connect with Kevin after the sermon over at guest reception, as Grant had mentioned, guest reception immediately after the service. I could talk to Kevin, kind of bend his ear a little bit and, and get some questions answered. Maybe he can clarify some things. But I was like, I would be commandeering the guest time. And if there's some guests up there, they may not like, you know, me talking about sermons and blah, 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 blah. You know, so I was like, well, that's not going to work out for me. So... I could go home, pull up my computer, bring up YouTube or Google, and Google it. I was like, oh, see if there are other sermons out there about sermons. But if you know anything about Googling or YouTube searches, you're going to get all kinds of stuff. As a great theologian, Forrest Gump said, <laughs> that's like a box of chocolate. You never know what you're going to get, right? So I put that aside. Uh, I thought maybe I'd just skip it. But if you know me, I don't give up that easy. I'm kind of competitive. So I decided to write the sermon myself. All right, I could do this, right? So I did. That's why it's titled, The Sermon That Will Never Be Preached, The Sermon That No One Will Hear. Because it was written just for me. I know, crazy. So the passage for this, for today, the scripture that I like to share with you, this is where I got that out of season thing. It's Paul's instruction to Timothy in his letter to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 2. Paul says this to Timothy, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke and exhort with complete patience and teaching. So this is Timothy's instruction, a pastoral instruction to this guy, Timothy. And I, you know, it's, it's spinning in my head and I'm thinking in my out of season time, preach the word, be ready, me, you know, teach, preach, whatever, I don't know. Um, surely this doesn't apply. This is a pastoral thing. And I am, I'm cruising. I'm in retirement mode, trying to be more retired-like. I, I got corrected at men's breakfast last Saturday, a couple Saturdays, that were, one of the guys said, you know, there's no such thing as retirement in the New Testament. And he's right. But in the Old Testament, there is. <laughs> the priests in the Old Testament, after they reached a certain age, were told to step back and let the younger people take over. Right? And they're to be instructors. So it's like, well, there is retirement, sort of. So I'm going to step back a little bit. And that's what we do on Youth Sunday. We step back a little bit and let the youth take over. So thank you guys for doing that. So retirement, maybe. But there's still this nagging thing, the Apostle Paul, you know, he's bugging me. Always be ready in season or out of season. Oh, dang it, Paul. So, so I'm going to, um, so what do I do? 
you know, I went home and I started writing this sermon to be ready. Sermon on sermons. So you're probably thinking, this is crazy. He's going to preach something about sermons, and I am not a sermon kind of guy. How many of you will ever find yourself up here, you know, preaching? I got to like, <laughs> no way. Um, you got to wear this thing, and it gets in the way. And it's like, ah. Oh. But very few people will ever sermon, preach a sermon up here. So is this applicable? Well, we're going to discover that. Um, what goes into writing a sermon? You know, I want to present to you an amateur's view. Have you guys ever heard of George Plimpton? He's a writer, a journalist for Sports Illustrated. He's known for what they call participatory journalism. So he got involved. He's just a regular armchair kind of quarterback guy. And he went and approached pro teams to say, let me play. Let me play at the pro level. So you're going to get me, an amateur, up here, Kevin the pro. I'm gonna, sorry, I'm going to say you're a pro. You're good at what you do. And I'm going to try to give you a little bit of what it takes. George Plimpton style. Anyway, let's, let's proceed on. Let's see. Um, so you're probably now thinking, well... Tom, they teach this in seminary, right? Sermons, how to do all that. Stand up here without swaying back and forth. Raising and lowering your voice, inflection, all that stuff. They teach that in, in seminary. And you would be right. They do. But just to make sure, I checked it out. So, I went to... I went to, I'm pressing this button, there it is. I went to Kevin's seminary. Why? Because he's my boss. You know, I got to impress the boss because <laughs> he could fire me at any time. I went to Bethel Seminary. This is a seminary located in Minnesota, but they had at the time a, a satellite campus in San Diego. And Kevin attended there and got his seminary degree. And so I looked up their seminary courses online. I didn't go there because it's a long drive. But I looked it up online. They have online catalogs. And looked up sermons, you know, how, their classes. And this is what I found. Um, and I thought this was pretty good. This is their description of their sermon classes. Effectively communicate the word of God in a manner that produces lasting, healthy change. And I'm thinking to myself, self, that's what I intend to do in youth group. I want the students to become lifelong followers of Jesus Christ. And so the things that I say, the things that I do, I try to communicate that to them. And I like that. I was like, oh, good. I, I'm in kind of lockstep with Bethel, even though I've never been there. I, I know a little bit about that what they're saying, and I, I, it resonates with me. But there was another class that caught my attention, <laughs> and you guys are going to laugh. But this was a class, it's CP720. CP stands for Communication and Preaching. CP720 was one of their classes. It's titled Finding Your Voice in Preaching. And I was like, all right. Now, if you know me, my mind... The wheels spin, and all of a sudden, I'm, I'm down this path where I'm thinking this is where they teach these seminary students how to talk with a deep voice. Ladies and gentlemen, the sermon. You know, I'm like, this is really cool. You know, of course, my brain just keeps going with it, and it's like, here is the announcer for the Rockies. Ladies and gentlemen, the batter. Charlie Blackman. It's a pretty good imitation. Wait, there's more. And then what happens? I don't want to lose your love. Tonight. Yes. And I'm thinking, th so this is, this is me, all right? I, I divert. I go off. Polly is shaking her head going, keep, keep on track, keep on track. But that's not what this class is about. It's not learning how to speak like a radio guy. It is um, talking about 
how to um, find your style. If you guys have been in churches a long time and you had different pastors, maybe when Kevin takes a break, Greg preaches up here, he's got a different style. When uh, Greg's not preaching or, or Kevin's not preaching, sometimes Stuart stands up here and he has a different style. Maybe you've been to a different church, you know, and they have a pastor that has a different style. It's unique to them. And this class is intended to find that style that suits you. And it's based on your life experiences, you know, your influences, maybe from your mother and father, maybe your grandparents influenced you. Maybe it was a youth leader, uh, guys who raised your hands as youth leaders. Maybe that's you that's influencing these students in a way to find their voice. And that's what this class is about, their voice, unique to you. And I like, wow. That's pretty cool. I like that. So hang on to that. We're going to circle around. I, I don't know. I'm going to circle. We're going to circle. Whee! Um, we'll come back to that in a little bit. But I, I did go to another seminary. I went to Denver Seminary. Denver Seminary is our local seminary down the road over here in Littleton off of Santa Fe. And I looked up their preaching classes. And it took me a while to find those classes because they don't call it preaching or sermons. They call it homiletics. And I was like, homiletics, what the heck is that? I had to look that up. What does it mean, homiletics? Well, it's the art, art, get this, the art of preparing and preaching a sermon. Now that kind of unfolded another part of, you know, as Kevin would say, unpack. We're going to unpack this thing. Uh, it unpacked another thought in my head about the art. That delivering a sermon is not just standing up here, but it's an art. How do you write it out? How do you clearly communicate something in a way that everybody understands? And they nod their head and go, yeah, that makes sense. So it's art. And art then implies to me that it takes effort to hone that skill, to work on it, much like a musician. You know, they practice. I, I know that it, you guys might think that's just a bunch of kids that got up there and sing. No, they practice. I practice with them. And, and they work on that skill to, to sing the right notes, to sing the right words, to uh, play, you know, guitar or piano. It all is a lot of work. That they are, you know, honing that skill to become good at what they do. And, and Billy, oh, here's a, I don't know, a little known fact about homiletics and, and working. Billy Graham, when he was around, he would write his sermon out and he would practice it. He said, I will never preach unless I practice this at least 25 times. He practiced his sermon. I think I practiced mine about 30. So, but <laughs> he practiced 25 times. If you know anything about Billy Graham, he would go into the woods and practice it with the trees. And he would speak to, point to stumps. And if you know how Billy Graham, his style, you know, he would have his Bible here and point. That's the classic Billy Graham picture. So there's my imitation. I, I gave you a bunch of imitations. That's my Billy Graham. But uh, he would practice and practice and practice to get it right. And of course, he was very successful. He could preach to thousands upon thousands in stadiums. And I thought, that, that's pretty cool. But I'm not Billy Graham. He's a pro. I am an amateur. Let's, let's remember that. So in this this thing keeps wandering up, and eventually it's going to go up my nose, but they told me if it gets that far, they'll, they'll give me the high sign and say the microphone's up your nose. So continue on with um, Denver Seminary. One of the things that they did also, like uh, um, Bethel, is they posted something like what you see there, committed to training men and women in the clear exposition of the Bible using something called the big idea methodology. And that was another term that kind of like, what is the big idea? I had to go find my friend. I have a couple of friends that graduated from Denver. I said, what is the big idea? And so they proceeded to tell me about what that means. Um, 
and we don't really have time to go into that, but, because it's huge, it's big, it's, anyways. Um, but the clear exposition. Exposition is a word uh, that's kind of like, well, I don't know what you mean by that, but it means to expose so, of the Bible, bring it out. Something when Stuart preaches, you see clear exposition. That's his style. He'll, he'll like, here's the scripture, here's what it means, here's what it says. Kevin does it too. You know, here's the scripture, let's unpack this. You've heard that term a lot. I'm sorry, I'm not going to say it anymore. But, um, uh uh-oh, somebody wants me to share the password. Somebody named Kurt. (laughs) So, anyways, sorry. Don't mess with me. The kids have, uh, speaking of messing with me, so in the youth room, we have the two big screens like we have here. Well, the students have figured out how to hijack it and get on there with their phones. And so they start putting pictures up of their friends. And I said, be careful. You know, I may be able to get on there and we could see your text messages. And they're like, (gasps) no, they get off right quick. But anyways, um, complete, done. All right, Kurt, you're good. (laughs) So big idea. We'll come back around on that. I got one more seminary. This is like the world's longest introduction to this, which is totally against sermon, you know, art. It's like, you know, you shouldn't do like long intros, but get over it. (laughs) One, One more seminary that I went to. I went to Dallas, Dallas Theological Seminary. You know, I, I said I kind of sort of randomly picked these, but I didn't randomly pick. I picked Bethel because Kevin went there. I picked Denver because it's the local one. I picked Dallas because a lot of my favorite authors and my favorite uh, professors that I like reading or listening to, you know, they went to Dallas. And um, Dallas is pretty cool. Um, they have tons of courses, probably twice as many courses on preaching than the other two seminaries. No offense. Um, but, and, and they have highly skilled professors in this world of sermonating. Um, and this is what they said here in their course, their, not a course description, but the group of course description. Preaching courses help students interpret and communicate the Bible, exposition, For the purpose of transformation, lifelong change, positive change, and this is what really, really kind of set the wheels spinning in my head. Um, Whether you're in a worship service like this, standing up here, nervous as all heck, or at a Bible study, you know, like Stuart or Mike, they teach a Bible study, they'll be teaching Hebrews coming up here pretty soon, Um, or around the campfire. They actually had that in their catalog. Teaching seminary students at Dallas Theological Seminary, the the bigs, the big leagues, the pros, teaching them how to do this around a campfire. Now that resonated with me big time and I felt compelled to use a prop. So, because I am all about camping, I brought my little log, and I have to apologize to my friend Russ, and I'm looking at the camera, because Russ is going to look at this online and shake his head, but Russ, my friend, challenged me to preach a sermon without a prop, and I failed. So, sorry Russ, but I'm going to go with this. I'm going to take this because it distracts me and put it back over here. Uh Uh-oh. Houston, we have a problem. There we go. All right. It wouldn't turn off. The fire wouldn't go out. So I really resonated with that whole campfire thing. So that's kind of like fits into my amateur view of preaching because I like camping and Preaching or teaching or doing those things that Paul told Timothy to do, rebuke, reprove, exhort, words that I don't know what they mean, but I'm sure that it means something positive because Paul said it. Those things I could do. And I think that now all of us, even if you're not into camping, and I know there probably are some that are not, we all carpool, we all 
maybe go to baseball games and you sit around chatting with your friends, maybe around the dinner table and you could preach a sermon or share something important to your family, your friends. And I thought that was pretty cool. That's something from a seminary. I thought that was pretty cool. So to summarize the seminaries, to summarize the seminaries, right, what the pros learn, what the professionals learn, right, they learn clear expositional style, how to read something from the Bible and present it. They learn that. that that's, that's across the board, those three seminaries. And I'm sure there are some better seminaries or worse seminaries out there. But those are the three that I chose. Um, they all talk about presenting the Bible with the purpose of transformation or positive change. And I thought that was good. And they using your voice, not mimicking the Rockies announcer, but your voice, flavored by what you know to be true, your experiences, your influences, you know, from whoever you've come across. Um, it's using your voice as an art also, homiletics, right? Using your voice to present something, maybe it's your testimony, clearly, um, and it's practice, it's refined, it's meaningful. That's what they're talking about, the big idea. It's meaningful, it's what's important in, of that passage. And it's also wherever you are, whether you're at home, at church, it's where you are. And I will add, I will add it's whenever you are, whether you're in season, or out of season. So now I'm feeling like pretty guilty that I should not be so retired like I should be more, uh, more, there we go, more like Paul. More like Paul is telling Timothy, preach the word. What did he mean by preach the word, by the way? You know, that's, if you break that down, unpack it. I said I wasn't going to say that anymore. If you break that down into the Greek, what does it mean? It means preach, proclaim it, the word, word, logos. It's the word. I was like, well, that doesn't make sense. What is, be more specific. Well, if you are using good biblical or Bible study technique techniques, you will look at the context. And in chapter 3, is the infamous passage where Tim uh, Paul tells Timothy, all scripture is inspired by God and it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, so, what, so that the man of God can be equipped for every good work. And that's what he's talking about. Preach that, Timothy, preach it. Do not get an amen. Hey, you guys are awake. That's a technique from, from seminary, right? Um, but, Paul, come on, Paul, you're a pro. Speak to me as an amateur, as a goofball, as one who has never taken a seminary class. <laughs> you guys are like, what? What are you doing up there? You... I am not a pro, right? I'm George Plimpton trying to pretend to be a pro. So when I think of Paul, I think Paul, you know, Paul is, I'm going to give you a little bit about Paul. Paul was, was, yeah, his credentials are impeccable. He is, you know, up here. He is the Hebrew of Hebrews, right? He was of the tribe of Benjamin. He's Pharisee trained, you know, uh, by Rabbi Gamaliel. Did I say that right? Close enough? I'm looking over at Mike Huber. He's kind of like, no, not even close. Uh, that guy was like a big time Pharisee, rabbi, head cheese, the big guy, you know, so Paul is trained by the guy. You know, Paul was also the apostle to the Gentiles. Um, he had it going. He also loved to debate or, as it's described, reason 
with the Jews and the Greeks. The Greeks, if you know anything about them, those guys are the philosophical guys, and they like to like, hey, tell me about this. Uh, let me, let's explore that. They were the thinkers. Paul liked to mix it up with them, duke it out, right? And Paul is, is up there. And I need to hear from somebody who's a little more on my level. <laughs> and you guys probably know where I'm going. I like Peter. Peter is a little more my speed, right? Peter was a fisherman. He was rough. He was reckless. You know, Jesus gave him the name. His real name is Simon. Jesus gave him the name Peter, which means rock. Peter, you're the rock. He, Peter was the rock before the rock was the rock, you know, do the eyebrow thing. I don't know if Peter could do that, but I, I, we'll find out. Um, but Peter, if you know anything, he sank like a rock, right? They're in the boat. You know, I don't know if you know the story. We did this on Wednesday, but, or, yeah, we did it on Wednesday um, with a skit, and it was the disciples in the boat. Peter, Jesus comes walking on the Sea of Galilee. The wind's blowing, everything's going crazy. The disciples are freaked out. They think it's a ghost, and they recognize Jesus, and Jesus is walking on the water. And Peter, rough and reckless, says, let me give that a try. You know, and he goes out there, and it's working, but then he gets whacked by the wave or two, and he takes his eyes off Jesus, and he sinks like a rock. I like that. I'm I, you know, I can relate to Peter. Peter is also the guy that falls asleep in the garden the night that Jesus was uh, the night that Jesus was betrayed. Jesus tells Peter and a couple other guys, James and John, stay awake, watch, and pray. And they fell asleep, not once but twice. There's a picture up in the youth room. We call it the what the heck Jesus. It's Jesus like, come on, guys, what the heck? Stay awake. That, I, I, that's my favorite portrait of Jesus because I think Jesus looks at me and is like, come on, Tom, stay awake. Stay with the program. Another thing about Peter is he also denies Jesus not once, not twice, but three times during the time when Jesus was being tried, right before he was crucified, Peter denies him. I'm like, okay. Paul, Paul completely different. Paul's all in. He's willing to die, go to prison, whip me, beat me, you know, make me write bad checks. That's Paul. Peter is like, I'm out of here. You know, see ya, I'm going fishing. So I relate to Peter a little bit more. Let's see what Peter writes. Oh, yeah, by the way, Peter was not as bad as I make him out to be, right? Peter did do some things right. He did. He did, uh, well, he did try to walk on water. It worked for a while. But he was chosen by Jesus. Wow, to be chosen and not just be chosen by Peter to be a disciple, but he was chosen to be one of Jesus' closest friends. Jesus saw something in Peter that he didn't really see in the other guys. That was like these guys saw Jesus do things that no one else saw. And that's pretty cool. And it, G, Peter did amp up his game, as you see in Acts chapter 4. Peter and John are preaching, and they're getting yelled at or chastised by the Jewish leadership. The Jewish leadership in Acts chapter 4, verse 13, they're like, who are these guys? These are unschooled guys, not pros. I like that. I like that. They are unschooled. Oh, but these are the guys that spent time with Jesus. I'm like, ah, oh, you don't really have to go to seminary to be cool or to be like Peter. So Peter writes this, and this is not one of those pastoral letters. This is a letter that Peter wrote to a large group of people in a large area under the sea, under the Black Sea. And this is where I usually say, under the sea. The, under the Black Sea, 
and they were persecuted Christians, and they were struggling with their faith. And Peter's writing this letter to encourage them. And I'm like, ah, that's good. I like, I like encouraging more than I like sermonating. You know, sermons are, but encouraging is a little more friendly. <laughs> And that's me. So Peter's writing this. He says this in 1 Peter 3.15. But in your hearts, honor Christ as the Lord, Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to, to anyone who asks you for the reason, for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. So there's Peter's way of saying in season, out of season, to a group of people not pastors, but struggling Christians, people that maybe are feeling they're out of season, they have left. They were called a dispersion. They were, they were being persecuted. So they scrammed out of Jerusalem and in that area to get away from persecution. And they're out there, but they're still being persecuted. And Peter tells them, always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the hope that is within you. What is he talking about? The hope. You know, what, what does that mean? I hope that I don't get arrested. I hope that, you know, it doesn't rain. And it's like, no, that's not what he's talking about. Because again, if you use good Bible study techniques, you would look at the context. And Peter in chapter one tells them about the hope, their hope, their hope in Christ, their faith. And they're like, wow, okay, now I'm on board. Now I can do this, I think, because I've got, I've got Peter, a non-pro, and he's telling me how I should do this. So let me catch up my, my teleprompter. It's woefully behind. I just totally blasted past it. So we're going to come full circle. We're going to... Here it is, all right, full circle. Whee! So, um, from the seminaries, three, th three things, well, four things. One is to learn how to expository preach or pull stuff from Scripture. Learn that, all right? Um, and then, from Bethel, use your voice. Find it, use it. Your voice it belongs to you. It deserves to be heard. Ooh, sorry. Uh, it deserves to be heard because it's your story. It matters. And where you do it, where you preach at, is not real significant. It doesn't have to be up here. So you need to work on it, practice it, homiletics, right? The art of doing it. Um, wherever you are, whenever you are. If you're in season, out of season, if you're at a campfire, at a baseball game, um, at a school function, wherever you're at, work on it. And from the scriptures, okay, there we go. From the two scriptures that we did, 1 Timothy 4.2 and 1 Excuse me, 2 Timothy 4.2 and 1 Peter 3.15. Preach the word. All scripture, all of it. Genesis through Revelation. In the youth room, we're working through Revelation. Um, so we don't shy away from anything hard, even though it might be scary um, at, in places. We're going to do it because we know that it is profitable. It's good. In Revelation, there's a blessing for those who read it, those who hear it. So we had to read it out loud. So we're in the process of reading it out loud. Preach the word, in season, out of season. Oh, here's a tone um, that Timothy is given by Paul. The tone is complete patience and teaching. That's good. That's not, I think Paul being, arr, 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 arr. he says, no, do it with complete patience and teaching. Make sure they understand. And then Peter, to his crowd, he write, always be prepared. That hope, you know, that, that kind of keeps you going even when you're out of season, right? And his tone, gentleness and respect. It's like, wow, this is good stuff. This is a sermon that I wrote 
for nobody. I have to share it. So, path forward. This is where the part of the sermon, you know, it's like, this is all good words. Um, but I need, to know, I need to give you something. When I usually teach the students, I usually say, this is something that you could put in your backpack and take to school with you tomorrow. You know, something that, that they can use. Because if we're just learning head knowledge, you know, we're not really getting anywhere. Paul is, is talking, Paul and Peter is talking about doing stuff. But if we don't give the students an opportunity to engage or t- expectation of engagement, like Youth Sunday, if we don't give them a platform, you know, when they graduate, they're just going to move on. But if we involve them, if we involve you, then things change. There, it's, it's a lot different when you are now involved. So this is what I'd like to do. This is kind of off. Kevin's like, oh, here we go. Um, at least I didn't put your email up there. But my church email, I'm on staff. Oh, I have a church email. It's tom at encompass.church. If you are feeling like I was, out of season, maybe you have a sermon in your brain swirling around that you might say, yeah, that's kind of me. I have a sermon that no one has ever heard. I don't know what to do with it. I would like to hear from you. Speak to me. Come see me. I don't have a church office, but I'm usually up in the youth room, which is up there. Um, That's kind of my office. So find me, and I would like to hear your story. Write it out. Send it to me in an email. I would love to work on it. You know those preaching classes in seminary? You know what those guys do? They sit around, and they write sermons, and they preach to themselves. Am I right? Yes. They preach to themselves. They're practicing. They're getting critiqued. You know, quit, quit swaying back and forth. Quit saying um all the time. Um. Uh, <laughs> I just said it. Uh. Anyway, they work on that. If you count how many times Kevin says um, it's zero. He's a pro. <laughs> if you've counted how many times I've said um, I know somebody, you guys, some of you guys out there are counting. So I don't know how, what am I, in the 40s, 50s, 60s? A longer sermon, the longer the sermon is, the more ums you get. So I'm not a pro. I'm an amateur. I'm George Plimpton, just telling you how it's done. That's how they do it in seminary. Why can't we practice that? I know Mike Huber has taught a class on, what do you call it, the non-confronter's guide to sharing the gospel. A class on how to share the gospel. You got Mike Huber's style. That's how he learned how to do it. I have a different style. I would like to share that with you. And there are many styles out there because you all have a different voice. You have different experiences and it matters. And I would like to develop that and get you guys involved. And if um, there's enough interest, perhaps we could do a class on it. You know, that class on how to exposit scripture, exegete scripture. That's another big word. Um, How to do that and how to present it in clear, meaningful ways that's transformational. All those words that you see in the seminaries, we can do that. And I'm willing to give it a whirl as an amateur that I have kind of spent a lot of time in the youth room practicing. Some fails, if you guys have been in the youth, you've seen some fails, you've seen me flounder, you've seen me cry like a baby. (laughs) Um, That's me, that's my style. And I'm willing to work with you guys on it if you're willing to give it a whirl. By the way, before I close, I, I think I'm doing pretty good on time. By the way, A lot of these seminaries that are out there offer classes online. So if you have ever thought about doing online studies, 
at a seminary level. Even if you're not a graduate student, they have Bible, you know, uh, like Bethel has Bethel Seminary. They have Bethel University where it's, it's undergrad classes you could take online. They can be expensive, but Bethel has something else. One more shameless plug for Kevin's alma mater. Bethel has uh, a group of classes called Seminary for Everyone. They're cheaper, they're shorter, um, and they're, they're available, and they're online. You could take the, go over to Bethel Seminary and, and look it up, and you can look through their, their, their web page. It's pretty cool. Um, shameless plug. I get nothing. There's no compensation for plugging any of these, but um, check it out. See if that is something you might be interested in. Um, the seminary for everyone classes, you could take that as a group. So if you get like more than six or seven people signed up, you can get a group discount, you know, and all sit around and take a seminary class. I think that would be kind of cool. So um, I'm going to close now. <laughs> so in closing, normally... I would say in closing, and the worship team would come back up, but they're not. So I'm just going to close with a benediction. Um, I'm going to use, I'm going to do another impersonation. Let's see if you can get who this radio personality is. And he says this. <clears throat> Be strong in the grace that is in you, Christ, that is in Christ Jesus. May God richly bless you, my beloved. Who said J. Vernon McGee? Yep, J. Vernon McGee. I love that guy. Uh, he's a Dallas Theological Seminary guy. By the way, just saying. Um, so let's close in prayer, and then Kevin's going to come up. So let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for helping me through this sermon that I wrote that no one will ever hear, but everyone's hearing it. I, I pray, God, that it's encouraging that um, those who are out there like me feel like they're out of season um, to realize that we're not out of season and that there is still something that we can be doing. We can be training. We can be building one another up. I thank you for every student that's here. They mean a lot to me. I, I enjoy hanging out with them. God, what a blessing um, you've afforded me to have a responsibility, and I do take it serious, God. And so I just thank you for those opportunities to, to do that. And I pray that as we leave, that we would seriously consider what you want us to do. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you, Tom. And I do want to encourage you, if you have never really shared God's word by sharing your story with someone else, uh, to take advantage of what Tom is offering. He's very authentic and genuine, as you can tell, and he will walk alongside you and help you with that. I'd be willing to do that as well. Uh, before we go, I do want to ask uh, for a about five more minutes. I want to share something that's coming up this fall that's important for our church. And uh, so if you have to sneak out because we've gone over time, you are welcome to do that. But if you can stick around, this is uh, something that I think is important for us to hear. Uh, if you were here for, at our annual meeting uh, way back in June, you heard this, but many of you uh, were not able to attend that meeting. And so uh, I just wanted to share with you some of the ways that God has been blessing us as a church that set us up for what's coming this fall. Um, in the past several years, We've had an ever-increasing number of baptisms. The last fiscal year, uh, we had 28 people profess faith in Christ and be baptized. And in that same block of time, we've added 97 new members. Uh, there is a baptism class or a baptism uh, celebration coming, as you heard, on September 10th. 
Uh, we also have that membership class coming on September 10th, so your opportunity to participate in either one of those things is coming soon. Now, our attendance during that time has also grown steadily. Our fiscal year runs from July through June, like a school year, and so that's why the dates are pairs of years there. But as you can see, uh, we were running about 270, 267 there uh, when COVID struck. And so like all churches in the nation, uh, we saw some fluctuations in attendance. But you'll notice that after that was over, that period of time was over, uh, we began to see the attendance go back to what it was before. And actually, this is fa fairly remarkable for our area. We returned to our pre-COVID numbers within a year. And that's very unusual uh, in the Franktown, Parker, Elizabeth Triangle, if you want to call it a triangle. Uh, there are very few churches that have returned to their pre-COVID levels. We did that in a year. Now, the interesting thing about that is that we did not do that because we were better than any of those churches. And if we were to say that, I think that would actually grieve God. I think the reason we have consistently grown uh, is that God has been blessing us for his reasons. He is blessing other churches in this area as well, but we're seeing a blessing numerically that some other churches, including some very large ones in Parker, have not yet seen by returning to where we once were. Now, if you look at the numbers for the last fiscal year, so this is July 2022 through June of 2023, you can see the average attendance on a weekly basis uh, for each month. Beginning in January, we began a fairly steady climb. And in April, we averaged 412 people per Sunday. That's after we took out the Easter Sunday numbers. So on Easter Sunday, we had over 900 people attend, but we took that Sunday out and still saw about 412 people on average during the week or during the month of April. Now in the summer, as is true with most churches, the attendance tends to go down, uh, but ours has been reasonably steady. We've been sitting at 355 from June through August. Um, the number actually averages out exactly the same across those three months. And what is typical for churches, if you have not grown up in a church or been in a church for multiple years, what is typical is at the end of the summer, the people who have been on vacation begin to return and the numbers begin to climb fairly steadily uh, in the fall. And so we are anticipating that we will return to the 400 or more mark uh, fairly quickly beginning after Labor Day. Now those numbers include kids in classrooms as well as people in this room at nine o'clock on Sunday morning. Um, so if we are beginning to see 400 in September, uh, we will find ourselves with a uh, quandary on our hands. Uh, it's a well-established statistical fact that when you have an auditorium like this, where people meet on a regular basis, like a church, and they walk in the room, and it's more than 80% full, and they have to sit right next to someone they don't know, that people stop coming. This is a study, uh, this, these statistics have been repeated over and over again. It's a human nature thing. If you're new here today and you sat right next to someone, I would be a little bit surprised. You're probably looking for a space where you could have an empty seat between you and the person next to you. Wouldn't that be true for most of you? So if we reach 400, this room is going to be full and it's going to continue to become more full. God is blessing us in a number of ways right now, even before we've gone into the fall. Our children's ministry is packed. Uh, we have more babies than we actually even planned for. And so almost every classroom has more kids than we have planned for. And we're making room for them, but we are solidly packed. Last week, we talked about our preschool. We have 54 kids right now. A couple of years ago, three years ago, we had 12. Uh, we are maxed out for our staff. We can add a couple more staff and squeeze a few more kids. We are licensed for 72, but we have a waiting list right now because we don't have the staff that we need to expand. And so that's a good thing, but it is an issue for us. 
Wednesday nights, this building is full. And by full, I mean every room you can meet in in this building starting next Wednesday night will have a group meeting in it. There's not a single empty room left in this building on Wednesday nights. Uh, two Sundays from now, we will kick off our new fall Sunday groups. Those are the bigger groups that meet during our second block of time on Sunday mornings. And uh, we also will be kicking off a bunch of life groups. Some already exist and some are new. We also live, as most of you know, in one of the fastest growing areas in the country. And we live in the fastest growing area in Colorado. Uh, the city of Castle Rock is the fastest growing city in Colorado. The city of Parker is the third fastest growing. The city of Aurora is number seven. They're all contiguous. And we have people from all three cities sitting in this room today. And we will continue to see more and more people arriving. Now, for some of us who moved out here years ago and hoped it would stay desolate and rural, that's not a great thing. But from a church vantage point, from people coming to know Jesus, that is a great thing. Every single Sunday, new people are walking into this church building. And they're wondering, is there something here for me? What are these people all about? What is this Jesus thing they claim that they follow? If we do nothing to make space for them, they will go somewhere else. And I know in a room this size, there's probably a few people that are thinking, that's okay with me. That is not okay with me. I hope it's not okay with you. If Jesus wants to send people here to find out what it means to have a relationship with him, to connect with other believers, to grow in maturity, and to serve each other and the world around them, what right do we have to say, you don't belong here and I will not make space? So what do we do? We follow our mission statement. We follow what Jesus said. Luke chapter 12, verse 48 Jesus said, when someone has been given much, much will be required in return. This church has been given much, and God keeps blessing us, not because we're special, but it, for his purposes and because of his will. Our mission statement says, Encompass Church exists to bring honor to God by developing more disciple-making followers of Jesus Christ. How can we do that if we're starting to feel full? We can build a new building, right? Pardon me, and our elders have actually begun to look into what our options would be in that kind of a situation. It's a three to four year process if we start today. So what do we do in the interim as new people join us this fall and continue to join us looking for what it is we celebrate and what it is we offer through a relationship with Jesus Christ. This is what we do. We add a second identical worship service on, Mon on Mondays. On <laughs> I guess that seminary training just went flying right out the window there. I can't even remember what day we meet. Uh, we had a second identical worship service on Sunday mornings. And to make that fit, we have to change the times. And so here is what is going to happen beginning October 1st. We will have new Sunday times, two identical services, one from 8.45 to 10 a.m. and the other from 10.45 to noon. That will give us 45 minutes in between, so we have plenty of time to socialize. So you have time to leave this room and immediately go and pick up your kids and get them to their next class if you are staying for the second hour. And so we have the opportunity to continue the fellowship that we value so much, the times that we spend with one another. 
Now, it'll be a challenge for us because we've already gone over the 75-minute uh, clock that is imposed by this new schedule. But uh, Pastor Greg and I and the rest of the teams are committed to making that happen so that we can make this a reality. Now, in order to do this, we, we definitely need more volunteers. We need volunteers in children's ministry, especially in the second hour. We need volunteers to be greeters, to be ushers. We need additional security team members. We need tech people. We need more people. But we have postponed this several times, and God, we believe, is showing us that he's about to bring in another wave of people. And so we have to get the ball rolling now. So I'm asking for you to consider, would you volunteer in one of those open slots? But I'm also asking for a bigger uh, challenge for some of you. I'm asking some of your families to say, in order to make this second service work, I will switch my normal schedule for three months, October, November, and December. And I will attend the second service so it's not just guests. So they meet people who are part of this church family. They feel welcomed like I was welcomed when I first got here. And I'm hoping that some of you will take that bait and go ahead and make that swap at least for three months to help us make that work. And I'm asking the rest of you to approach this with a curious and willing spirit. What might God do? Change is hard. Even 15 minutes earlier will frustrate some of us. But think of what God could do if this room was available twice on Sunday morning. On average, when a church goes from one service to two in a healthy growing area, their numbers jump very quickly simply because people have options. There are many people who cannot be here early, and so they will come to the second service. And we need you, some of you, to be there, to be a part of making them feel welcome enough to come back and hear what God has to say for them and possibly enter into a relationship with Jesus. So I've made the decision to take a break from our Mark series for the month of September. We'll resume it in October, but in the month of September, we're gonna take a look at what God says in scripture about the kind of season that we are in and where would he have us go and how would he challenge each one of us individually to pursue this new season and this new opportunity. I hope you'll join with me. Let me close this in a word of prayer, and then you'll be dismissed. Father God, we thank you for the amazing things you're doing for this church. We know we are no better than anybody else, any other church that you lead and encourage and have plans for. But you seem to be doing something here that is almost unexpected for many of us. You continue to send new people to come and hear about your son. Lord, help us to be faithful. Help us to walk into this new season with a sense of encouragement and anticipation and joy at watching you work with the hope that we will each make some new friends in addition to the wonderful friends you've already given us. Bless us, Lord, as we step out in faith. Go with us this week and encourage us. We pray these things in the name of the one we celebrate, your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Have a great week and we'll see you soon.